So I'd like to thank the Irish Astronomical Society for welcoming me along to give this talk and um, it's always a pleasure to be able to give talks. I used to represent the Planetary Society more than I do today and that gave me more opportunity so it's always as I say, a pleasure to give a talk. The name of the talk today is called Voyager and Beyond and um, the whole idea of the talk was just to look at the outer solar system and in fact beyond the outer solar system to see what we're doing because there's a surprising amount of work being done to make us aware of the vicinity of the solar system and not even that, the, I suppose, local neighbourhood of the Milky Way within which we reside. And this, this work is not necessarily coordinated or an individual set of groups doing it, it's just, it's very active, it's global and there's a surprising amount going on. Now, the thing is, is that if we consider the night sky, um, we've often said in many a book, you know, uh, the night sky is our local cosmic neighbourhood. And certainly um, as an astronomer, a budding astronomer all through the years, I've never quite bought into that because you look at the stars and you realise that they're inaccessible. They're just these point of light in the sky and there just seems to be no way to connect with them whatsoever. It's slightly different for the moon and the stars or the planets, but for the stars, I, I, I've, I've always felt the, star, the stars felt very, very remote, very disconnected. And certainly in previous decades, we would have felt that, you know, these were really Im impenetrable. We can analyse the nature of stars through advanced techniques, but anything beyond that hasn't really been within our privy to be able to analyse and understand. And hopefully I'll show through this talk that actually that's changing. The night sky that we see is actually indeed our, our neighbourhood and we're getting to know it. And one of the, I suppose, the points I suppose I'd like to uh, um, uh, put forward to you listen to this talk is that, you know, you can be invested in that. You can get involved in that. There'll be citizen science type projects I'll mention. But not only that, as we discover more, you can go out even with binoculars and telescopes and look at particular stars in the sky and know there are planets there or know something about the characteristics of the night sky. So it really is becoming our cosmic neighbourhood. And the other thing as well is, is that what I find interesting about what's going on in the outer solar system is that almost like astronomers of old. So um, we had... Uh, Galileo and Cassini and, and, and all these other people at the birth of modern astronomy who were looking at the planets through even through small telescopes as perhaps the furthest domain of what they could study, what they could look at, that they were, you know, um, uh, basically stretched to the limit to build the best telescopes they could with the technology at the time. And they did that. They stretched themselves. They, they asked questions about what are the next things. Galileo wanted to know what those four little points of light around Jupiter were. He wanted to understand the phases of the moon and what, what, what the, the crater markings were and so forth. And Cassini was struggling to understand the nature of the, um, the rings of Saturn. So these, these people were asking the, the, the most cutting edge questions and, 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 and pushing themselves to the limit. And in fact, I think that's really part of not just a, a, a trait of, of, of um, astronomers, but of humans is to ask a question about something we don't know, like what's there? I want to know more about that. Even for any of us who've been interested in astronomy since we were kids, if we had a little telescope we bought at Christmas when we were a child, you know, we'd push it to its limit. We'd buy a Barlow lens, we'd clean it, we'd polish the lens to get every last drop of performance out of that telescope. And that's no different today, especially when we look to beyond the solar system, that we're pushing our instruments and we're pushing our space probes to the very, very limit. So as sophisticated and exciting as what we're doing today is, it's really no different to what Tycho Brahe was doing or what Galileo was doing or what you or I do on a given night when we are out in our back garden with our telescopes or our binoculars trying to squeeze the very best out of them. So in a sense, this kind of exploration, I would say, is kind of like, it's apolitical. It's beyond, you know, uh, the, the big science in a sense that, you know, we've got CERN is very directed or maybe there's a competition between China and America when it comes to the space race. This kind of exploration is actually genuinely kind of quite raw, quite pure quite you know um, innocent as a, as a human trait to want to understand what's out there beyond our current understanding and how can we connect with it ever more and push it and push the boundaries for the next generation in that regard so of course there's I, while the talk is called Voyager and Beyond it really starts with those great astronomers of ancient and of Galileo and all of those astronomers who are trying to push the boundary um, and, and, and we're part of that ongoing story that no doubt will continue long into the future. Now these two images are of Saturn and Jupiter before Voyager in the mid-1970s, mid before they visited planets. And 
basically you can see that while they're interesting images, they really, really aren't a lot better than maybe would have been seen by a great telescope in the 19th century. And as a person in my 50s, I well remember that time when Mars was a mystery, Jupiter was a mystery, we didn't really know anything at all about Saturn, other than it had these rings that we suspected might be made of maybe water or maybe ice or maybe, you know, who, who, we didn't know whether they were particles or whether it might be a flat plane, we just didn't know. But when Voyager visited the outer solar system, it changed everything. And here are some of the people behind that, I think it's always important for us to remember, there are people who, just like yourself and myself, who push these um, uh, projects that we've got. Um, Carl Sagan and Bruce Murray in the lower image here. We have Carl and Porco who was involved in both Voyager and also um, uh, um, the Cassini project that she, and she, she, in fact, Carl and Porco, I should say, has just started a new online newsletter as in this week, I follow her on Facebook, so that might be worth checking out. She's a lot to say. She's kind of like a modern-day Carl Sagan in a way, maybe not quite as famous. And Ed Stone, who was the famous head of the Voyager project, anybody of my vintage, or go check out Ed Stone. He was the, he is, he's still around, but he was the hero of Voyager. He ran the show and uh, basically brought us to the outer solar system. That's the gentleman to the left in this image. The people in the centre image formed the Planetary Society, which is still going strong today. And the gentleman in the fawn jacket is Carl Sagan, who was a hero probably to a huge fraction of scientists who are around today. He passed away, unfortunately, in the 90s of a rare blood cancer, but um, he was a massive influence on the whole astronomical, planetary science, and general science world. Well, just before Voyager, actually, we had the pioneer pioneers, and they were launched in the early 70s, and arrived at Jupiter um, around 1974, and Saturn actually in 1979. And these pioneers really were pioneers. They were test instruments. And when you think about it, that these were built and launched in 1973, the space race was from 1957, so what's that? Just 16 years after the, uh, the origin of the, the space race, or the space era, we're already sending space probes to the outer solar system. And this bears to the point that, you know, we do these things the minute we can actually push them forward, we, we try. You know, we want to, it's, it's human nature, we give something a shot the minute we're able to do it. Now, Jupiter, as you can see here from this, these images of Jupiter, that they were good images, but they weren't, they weren't um, how can I put it, revolutionary. They didn't really fundamentally change our outlook on the outer solar system. I mean, they were exciting, but we could achieve close to that with the best telescopes on the ground on Earth at the time. So these were truly testbed um, missions pioneer uh, 10 and 11. Um, and even when they reached Saturn in 1979, as you can see from this image, they were good, but they were grainy, and they didn't really tell us an awful lot more about the planet. But however, we knew we could get there. And so shortly after then, the Voyagers uh, were launched in 1977, and they were sent on what's called the Grand Tour of the Outer Solar System, because every 279 years, the planets align, and Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune were aligned through the 70s and 80s, and that's where we were able to slingshot Voyager 1 and 2 from each of the planets to the next, and actually go on this great Voyager discovery. Now, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 fundamentally changed our outlook on the outer solar system because while there were, it was this again remote domain that we didn't really have a lot of kind of sense of what it might be about, as you can see from this stunning image of Jupiter, suddenly we realized that this was an absolutely gargantuan planet of extraordinary dynamism. And in fact, as we looked closer, we could see that the atmosphere was unbelievably turbulent, and then the moons themselves turned out to be sh uh, as striking with Io, as we can see here, volcanic plumes, and we discovered that there might be 10 to 12 active volcanoes in Io at any given time, and the plumes reach, say, two, 300 kilometers into space. It's been churned inside out by Jupiter, uh, so, so powerful is Jupiter, and Europa, the smoothest surface in the solar system, it cracked, and we suddenly realized that this might be actually uh, water, and then we, we, we were able to confirm that, that indeed, we and now we think we want to go back there to discover that there might be an under... Uh, under ice ocean on Io, but, but it was Voyager that gave us this um, incredible insight. And likewise with Callisto and Ganymede, equally compelling moons. All of these planet-sized moons, so Jupiter basically like a little mini solar system within a solar system, and this is what we, we, we started to realise, is that we were in an extraordinary system that had ex incredible energy, incredible power, incredible dynamism, and um, that's what Voyager brought to us, is that the, the reality of the solar system we're, we're actually living in. Now, it took a couple more years, the 1980-81, for Voyagers to get out to Saturn, but likewise, it happened all over again. We realized that Saturn was a gargantuan system, not quite as big as Jupiter, with astounding rings, and then this whole family of moons that, um, uh, at the time, even, you know, just revealed extraordinary characteristics, um, like Mimas, with this incredible uh, ex um, uh, crater on it, where, you know, um, re revealing um, some um, extraordinary uh, um, incidents 
incident in the past, and I able to stare, which is half black, suggesting that, again, the material probably from one of the other moons spilt down onto Iapetus on a planetary level, given um, whatever calamity had happened in the past. So the moons of, of Saturn, and it's, it's ongoing, we're still discovering moons, we're over, over 70 moons orbiting Saturn, um, we're just realising just how extraordinary, as extraordinarily powerful um, and important on a solar system level that these planetary systems are. So this is just again some images um, of Saturn and a beautiful image of the of Saturn from behind as the Voyagers left again revealing to us that we've been to Saturn and we're moving on. And the Voyagers then in the late 80s then visited Uranus which turned out to be incredibly bland looking as you see in this image but with uh, you know infrared cameras and with uh, other detectors we were able to discover that Uranus was nothing but bland. It's tilted on its side, it's rotating off axis by ni near 90 degrees, it's got a, 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 um, a set of rings just like Saturn although they're much fainter and then some extraordinary moons like here we've got Miranda with a, with a chip knocked out of it with 20 kilometer um, uh, um, cliffs here that if you jumped off it takes several minutes to land because the gravity is so low. So again worlds telling us of a dynamic past, a very active past, and, and a past full of um, calamities and catastrophes and interactions that tell us of a very active um, e evolution of the solar system that we simply had absolutely no idea of from the ground. The same when we went into Neptune, uh, seeing Neptune with its own weather systems and its moon Triton, which again has some of the most extraordinary geology in the entire solar system with liquid nitrogen uh, volcanoes and um, uh, a actual um, uh, um, crust that we can see changing even over short time frames telling us that even at these freezing temperatures there's activity occurring out there. Now as the voyagers were leaving the solar system, Carl Sagan asked for the cameras to be turned back one more time to take a family portrait of all of the planets as seen from the edge of the solar system. And the famous one here, um, the pale blue dot, is an image of Earth. It's that tiny little pale blue speck in the rightmost beam, and that beam is actually a, a, a sunbeam in the in the lens of the camera. So it's a, it's, a, it's an optical artifact, but artifact. But um, you see how how frail Earth is. And Carl Sagan wrote a seminal book called Pale Blue Dot, and then this beautiful piece that's on the slide here. Basically, his argument is is that. This is where we make our stand. And he was one for believing there might be life on other planets, but he knew we're very isolated. If we want, you know, if we want to survive, we've got to look after Earth to survive. Now, the Voyagers also carried a message on a disk. They carried information as to where we are. They carried information about our maths, our science, our biology. They carried images of the air planet Earth. Um, and they also carried um, greetings of Earth in 52 languages and music from Beethoven to Bach, or the, the Beatles. Um, I'm not sure if you know the little anecdote whereby when one of the designers of the disc was asked, why didn't you put Johann Sebastian Bach on the disc? His answer was, well, that would be boasting. So the thing is, is that we uh, basically put our best foot forward with these discs and they're traveling to interstellar space. They'll never return to Earth, and this is, I suppose, an indicator that even in the 70s we were thinking beyond ourselves. As unlikely as it is, we're proposing to ourselves that on the off chance that another civilization exists, we're going to tell them the best about ourselves. So again, it's that kind of, as I say, apolitical, um, human nature thing to want to communicate, to want to discover, to want to find others like ourselves. And also, it should be pointed out that all the way through the 80s and the 90s, we were sending space probes out to look at other worlds, particularly comets, asteroids in the asteroid belt. So here we have two European projects, in fact, Giotto, that visited Halley's Comet in 1986, and then the Rosetta, Rosetta that um, uh, probe with the Philly Lander, from which Ireland put one of the organic instruments from Professor Susan McKenna Lawler and Minute, uh, that landed on them on this um, uh, asteroid or a comet, I should say, and you can see the images of that in the lower uh, half of the slide. Uh, and in fact, the Philly Lander did discover organic molecules on comet 67P is the letter designation for the actual comet. I can't pronounce the, the Russian uh, who discovered it, but basically uh, 67P will get you there. Uh, but it indicates again that uh, you know, this is not to be taken for granted or to be trivialised. Like somehow uh, we convince governments and we convince big agencies to spend hundreds of millions, if not billions of euro to visit these worlds. And again, I, 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 to harp on at the central point of the talk is that we, we find it worthwhile enough to do these things at least to that level. And this continues. So once we've actually vi we visited the outer solar system, then we, we, we decided we need to revisit 
I mean, and so therefore that started off almost immediately. Well, we, we're thinking two ways. We're thinking go further, and we'll come to our new horizons to Pluto shortly, but also now that we've done a reconnaissance of the outer solar system, let's revisit. So we had Galileo to Jupiter in the 90s, and we had Cassini to Saturn in the noughties, and actually up until 2017. So this is an image of Galileo being launched by the space shuttle. Um, it uh, um, arrived uh, at Jupiter around 1994, 1995. It had a failed uh, high-gain uh, high, high antenna, so it could only transmit several bits, I think about 10 bits a second back to Earth. So it was a compromised mission. But nevertheless, it stayed orbiting Jupiter, even imaged a comet, Comet Schumacher-Levy, crashing into Jupiter in July 1994, and then imaged some even more spectacular images of Jupiter and characterized the moons very much in particular. So we gained an awful lot more insight into Io. Here we actually see lava flows on the surface from the one volcano. These are kind of time-lapse images and much higher resolution images of Europa. And it was true Galileo that we became convinced there's a liquid ocean under the surface and why we're going to send even more probes back there in the next 10 or 15 years. So these are all images of Europa and all these trails and tracks are pure water ice and the dark material uh, we think is actually organic material and indeed we were thinking that for, for a long time and only this week the James Webb Space Telescope has confirmed it uses uh, infrared telescopes to confirm that the black streaks in Europa are organic material so this is incredibly exciting we're now past reconnaissance we're talking about going back to these worlds to explore them in real depth we also have Juno on Jupiter right now, which is orbiting in a polar way, which is unusual. Usually probes will orbit around the equator, but it's doing gravimetric measurements and, and probing the inside of Jupiter and sending back these extraordinary images like you see here, particularly of the polar regions, which we had never seen properly before. Um, and so, we, as I say, we continue our explorations of the outer solar system. Then we had Cassini to Saturn, and I'm going to step quickly through these images because there's so many of them. Cassini really is where we matured as a planetary exploration, you know, uh, society, because Cassini spent multiple years, uh, um, about a decade, in and around uh, the Saturn system, and it actually made multiple close passes to Saturn, to moons like Titan, Enceladus, and other moons as well, like Apetus, Mimas. Um, and so we had to change its orbits all the time. It had to have trusted fuel on board to be able to manipulate its orbits. And we also had to manage its movement in amongst a number of uh, moons, which is a very, very, very sophisticated from a, uh, you know, an orbit's calculation standpoint. So we really figured out how to do planetary exploration of outer solar system-like bodies uh, with extraordinary detail. I mean, it's a different kind of planetary exploration on Mars, but artificial intelligent robots like Curiosity and, and Perseverance, that we're really maturing at as well. But this kind of orbit, orbiting, extended orbital stays at complex systems, we, we utterly nailed it with Cassini. And the results were truly spectacular. So now this is a mosaic of it arriving at uh, one moon. I'm not sure which moon it is as it arrives at Saturn. But both are images from Cassini. But here's a beautiful image of Saturn and its rings. And you can see already, even from afar, this is several weeks out, that the image resolution is higher than Voyager. And boy was it, because once it got up close, as you can see from this image, we were able to see the rings in un, un, unprecedented detail. So here's a, some stunning images of this wonderful system of moons, rings, and a gorgeous planet. Surely the most beautiful system in the solar system. As, as, we, as we would say, that the terms like the harmony of the heavens or um, you know, the harmony of the spheres um, pertains to this system because everything is such so harmonious the way the, way the, the laws of nature, and in particular gravity, work. So here's, for example, a very close-up image of the rings with a tiny little moon, that little dot within, within the black space, and it's disturbing the ring material. Now, the rings are only about 10 metres thick. They're, only, they're, they're not even the width of um, the 18-yard box in a, a football pitch. That's how, how thin they are edge on. Um, and we believe they're made of uh, um, ice particles from uh, sub, sub um, millimeter, you know, basically micron size, maybe up to uh, meters or 10 meter size ice particles. That's what we think they are. And, and Cassini didn't get far off that kind of resolution, as you'll see. So here we see, for example, in this image, in the upper part of that image, we're seeing shadows from what are vertical, uh, vertically tossed up, kind of almost like ice 
Isolates or um, what, what, um, icicles uh, pointing upwards that might be about 100 metres high, casting a shadow on the rings as they were disturbed by a moon passing by. And the thing about the dynamics of the rings is, is that if anything is thrown out of the plane of the rings, it wants to fall back down to lower its energy level. So, from a kind of a, a, an orbital dynamic standpoint, Saturn won't lose its rings from, from moon interactions. It actually um, just produces beautiful perturbations and then. Um, it, um, it all returns to uh, um, beauty afterwards. Here we see three tiny moons disturbing the rings, including one moon literally in the rings. You can see it there. Here's another moon disturbing the ring, and we just see close up the kind of um, change that, that occurs when the rings are actually interacted with. Again, we can see it there from above, and then we even see a shadow of the moon on the rings. Isn't it, aren't they just absolutely spectacular images? So Cassini, as I said, brought us a spectacular understanding of Saturn's rings and also of its moons. So here's some close-up images of some of its moons, in particular Iapetus, which we saw Voyager see, and now look at the difference with Cassini. We can see absolutely incredible detail of whatever deposits were, were placed on it. And we were able to analyze this using a technique called spectroscopy, where we can basically take the light from Iapetus, pass it through a set of prisms, and lenses and focuses and then be able to determine what are the material makeup of these moons. Uh, of supreme importance for Cassini was Titan because Titan is nearly the size of Mars. It has an atmosphere seven times as dense as Earth's, a nitrogen atmosphere, about three or four times the, the, air, pre or the air pressure down there because it's smaller than Earth so the gravity isn't as strong, but seven times the density and also it has liquid um, nit methane and ethane lakes and seas. So here we see a reflection from the sun of um, a, a large lake about the size of the North Sea called Kraken Lake. And here we see then an infrared image where Cassini was able to see through the thick atmosphere using infrared an image. All of the kind of this disturbed um, kind of black mottling is the lake and the bright yellow patch is the sun reflecting off it. Um, I'm not quite sure what the red is. I'm sure it's just um, maybe more of the, of the sun, sun's light at a, at a different angle. But nevertheless... We were able to image this moon in absolute detail, and not only that, drop down to it using the Huygens uh, space probe. So we've landed on Titan. And now that, that just lasted a few hours, and we got some images of the surface, but we, again, we want to go back there, and there are already plans, well, if not plans, at least proposals of plans that hopefully will become plans and missions in the future to send space probe back there. And indeed, we think we want to send mini heli helicopters there, like we're doing on Mars. And then we've got, of course, Enceladus, this beautiful icy moon of Saturn, maybe the, anal the analogue of, of Europa, where it's kind of an icy surface with cracks in it, and again we know there's, there's a liquid ocean underneath. In fact, we've seen geysers from it flow out of them. Cassini passed through them and determined they're pure water, and those geysers or geysers are actually feeding into Saturn's rings. So I, um, Europa, or sorry, I beg your pardon, Enceladus is in part one of the, it's one of the the uh, these the source um the sources of Saturn's rings is is the the water escaping from this moon or is flowing into the Saturn ring system, which is quite extraordinary. Now, of course, in twenty um seventy, I believe it was, I've forgotten the date precisely. Uh, Cassini ran out of thruster fuel, so we couldn't just let it drift among the system; it might crash into one of the moons, like. If Enceladus is, possesses, for example, basic life, we don't want Cassini to crash on it because it might have microbes from Earth on it and will contaminate it. So we, had to do, we felt we had to do a crash landing of Cassini into the moon, which we did. And then these are some of the final images it took. And here we see the rings in extraordinary detail, where every line is some sort of clearance of the ring by one of the moons. We got what were called resonances between the moons and the rings, creating this kind of you know, vinyl record look effect of the rings themselves, just um, and we're down near the meter, maybe 10 meter resolution in some of these images, just absolutely spectacular. But here we kind of see an artist impression as to the Cassini probe before it crashed into Saturn. And this is the last image it ever took of Saturn. You can see the rings in the lower part and the planet just above it, and it dived down between the gap between them and crashed into Saturn, never to be heard from again. Now, no longer was, no, no sooner was that done, but we were basically already out of Pluto. So here we got the New Horizons space probe, in fact, that visited Pluto in 2015. And if we take a look at this image, we can see that the trajectory of the New Horizons space probe out to Pluto was done with incredible precision. Um, and you can download, for example, for all of these missions, the guidebook that the, um, those navigating from Mission Control use to guide the space probe. And you just begin to realize the um, extraordinary detail by which, by which we plan these missions. So not only did we know um, precisely 
um, where um, New Horizons was going to pass uh, through the Pluto Charon du double planet system, in a sense, or, or, or dwarf planet system, but we also knew on um, what latitude and longitude, which parts of Pluto we would be imaging using the cameras at every stage through the entire flyby of the, of the system that only took a few hours. And here, for example, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, an image of uh, showing part of where the camera was going to image and the, of course the famous images of that of for example the heart and Pluto here we go and then um, Charon its moon which is very battered with a totally different type of geology which tells us that Pluto and Char Charon originated from different parts of the solar system and came together through some sort of merger and then uh, even as um, New Horizons flew behind Pluto so it's looking in towards the Sun in these images we can see indeed Pluto has a very tenuous atmosphere so even out in the coldest reaches of the solar system, we're seeing that in fact that things move on Pluto. It's got a dynamism to it that the universe or the solar system doesn't have to be just static because it's cold. That we get as much movement on moons like Titan and Triton and Pluto as we might do on Mars, but um, involving different kinds of materials, involving liquid nitrogen and gaseous nitrogen, and it's this thing from you know maybe closer to us water and carbon dioxide. Nevertheless, a, a dynamism in the outer solar system that um, we wouldn't have imagined could have been uh, the way it was until we went there. Now, um, did these missions stop once they visited those planets? Absolutely not. All of them, including New Horizons, have now what we call an, defined an interstellar journey or an interstellar mission. So Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, now they switched off a lot of the instruments to save power. Um, so, for example, all these probes use uh, um, what's called um, uh, um, nuclear radioactive uh, thermal um, electricity generation. To, in short, they use plutonium-238 isotope to create heat, to create a voltage. And that plutonium... Uh, um, uh, this this isotope of plutonium has a half of 88 years. So after 88 years, you've only got about half the power. Now the Voyagers are what? They're um, 46 years old. So they have lost about a third of their power, maybe a bit more. And we're having to be very careful. So we power off as many instruments as we can. But nevertheless, these um, um, interstellar missions are all about trying to understand what, if anything, is there beyond the, the, uh, the planet, well, now the dwarf planet Pluto. And what we've discovered in recent decades is that there's a whole new domain out there. So we've got, first of all, the Kuiper Belt, which stretches probably about out beyond Pluto as the distance from us to Pluto again. So you can kind of imagine us to Pluto, the outer solar system, that's about 5 billion kilometers, then go about maybe another 5 billion again. And in the Kuiper Belt, we estimate to be a trillion worldlets that are 100 meters and bigger in size. And we estimate 100,000 worlds that might be 100 kilometers in size. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful to visit one of them and using the help of the Hubble Space Telescope, indeed we were, we were able to direct New Horizons only a couple of years after visited Pluto to visit one of those Kuiper Belt objects. Um, uh, named at the time Ultima Tool, but in fact it's got a formal name now of uh, Arrowcoth, that's its name, and it was visited um, in 20, was it 16, 20, 2017, and there's an image of it. In fact, it's two little worlds that are joined together, revealing, again, this sort of, when you see something like this, you realise that the history of the solar system is very strange. How do these worlds come together? Um, and now we've discovered many of these different objects. In fact, we realise the Kuiper Belt is very complex and we know very little about what it ultimately might be. So understanding the Kuiper Belt, visiting many of these moons, is a big goal in astronomy because it's kind of like the taxonomy of the of uh, in biology when biologists figured out how to classify the different kingdoms and phylums of life they began to understand both the nature of biodiversity and also the evolution of life on our planet likewise when we analyze the taxonomy or the different categories of planets and subplanets and dwarf planets and asteroids we understand how the solar system came together and that's indeed why pluto was demoted from being a planet to being a dwarf planet not really because it doesn't you know scoop out everything in its orbit it's because in fact pluto originated in the same way as the trillion other worlds in the Kuiper Belt. They were born inside near Jupiter, and Jupiter and Saturn and the other great planets pushed them out over time to the outer solar system. So they're, they're, it's not that it's lesser as a dwarf planet, it's just a different category of object. And it tells us something about the, how the solar system works and, it's, and how it's still going on because the solar system is still changing.
So a great ambition and objective of ours is to understand both the Kuiper Belt and then, as you see in this slide, an even bigger domain beyond that called the Earth Cloud, which forms a disk out to hundreds of um, um, hundreds of, uh, of, of um, or probably about 100 billion kilometers, um, called the Hills Disk, and then becomes a sphere. And what are, are they a disk and sphere of? Of comets. Of, we estimate again about a trillion comets. And they surround the solar system out, some people estimate, the, about three light years, which is three quarters of the way to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri. Many tend to say about a light year. But I think we have to scientifically say there's evidence that some comets that visit us come from 3.2 light years distance, meaning that we may have a cloud of comets out that far. And we want to know more about that. And we're going to start exploring that. And that's really for the next stage with these super rockets like the Space Launch System and um, Star... Um, 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 SpaceX's Starship, but I'll mention more of that at the end of the talk. But apart from the material objects, we also realise that the Sun and the solar system occupy a different kind of presence in the Milky Way galaxy, based on the notion that the Sun has a gigantic um, magnetic field stretching out about 20 billion kilometres in every direction, and that magnetic field stops or prohibits an influx of cosmic rays um, and other, and even the galactic magnetic field from coming in towards us. And you can see in this image, it's like as if we're in a bubble, and the blue bubble there is the sun's protective shield, magnetic shield, and outside of that is the milk is interstellar space. It's um, uh, a very different kind of domain, and it is because the cosmic particles that come from the rest of the Milky Way galaxy are m very often millions of times more powerful than the co than the, the cosmic rays or particles that the sun emits, for example, or indeed that Jupiter emits. And that's really important to know: is if we ultimately want to travel to the stars, well, what's in the interstellar medium? So, as far fetched as it might sound that we might want to travel to the stars, nevertheless, here we do. Here we find ourselves in the early twenty first century actually beginning to explore interstellar space and it was actually that kind of notion that gave me the thought that, to propose this talk to Mick you know um, when, when he proposed a talk for the IAS because you know I kind of find it actually intriguing I think I like to know that we're living in the era where we're thinking about exploring interstellar space and indeed we are so to that end um, the voyagers were told to keep on several of their instruments to detect what plasma to detect cosmic ray detectors the magnetic field all of the kind of the um, non camera type devices were told to stay on and are still on and then a Voyager detected a kind of a fall off of the sun's particles and then started to notice an influx of cosmic particles then it would have realized it would have breached well, the, the outer, um, outer heliopause the sun's influence and it would have stepped into interstellar space and indeed both voyages have done that already Voyager 1 did that I think it was in 2014 uh, August 2014, and then Voyager 2 did it in around 2018, 2019. And each of them, this graph shows a fall off of um, actually the, um, the sun's particles. Um, suddenly it was beyond where the sun was sending particles. Why? Because the interstellar space was blocking them. So it had stepped from one domain into another, um, and we realized that now the Voyager spacecraft are truly in interstellar space. They're no longer in the influence of the sun. And they continue to work, and they will continue to work, hopefully until um, at least 2025. Uh, in fact, they're trying to get them to 2030, um, and they may do that because they've still got power. But believe it or not, a little probe orbiting the Earth has also been scanning interstellar space. And you might ask, how can a probe orbiting the Earth study interstellar space? And I find this a really fascinating little mission called the Interstellar Boundary Explorer. And what scientists were able to figure out was, was that when particles from the sun's influence flowing outwards would interact with particles, say, or, or, or gas, maybe hydrogen gas from the rest of the Milky Way, um, under certain conditions, they split that gas up into individual atoms of hydrogen or individual atoms. So, for example, hydrogen gas is made of two hydrogens, H2, hydrogen 2, joined together. And you split that up, you get two hydrogen atoms. So you get... When usually when you get energetic interactions, you get molecules split up into their individual atoms. And this is happening on the boundary of the interaction of the sun's magnetic field with interstellar space, and we can see it. And indeed, not only can we see it happen, because what happens is some, some, some of those then hydrogen atoms are propelled at high velocity back in to the inner solar system and we know how many of them we should see we know the flux we should see and so this interstellar boundary explorer has been studying um, uh, the, the detection of neutral gases from the boundary of the interstellar medium and not only has it detected it 
at a rate of about 15 particles, uh, I think, a day, or it might be per hour, actually. Um, but it also has detected when it scans around the whole sky that there seems to be this kind of, like, ribbon of interstellar material bouncing off the edge of our so of, of the sun's um, influence of the outer edges of our solar system. And so not only have we detected this influence, but we think we may have even started to map the beginning of the interstellar region beyond the, the sun's uh, influence. And I think, think, again, I think you might agree with me, it's quite extraordinary that, that we're even bothering to do this, that somebody came up with this mission and then proposed you know, needing millions of euro or millions of dollars from, from either the US government or Europe. I think this is a US mission, actually. And then, and then somebody said, yeah, let's fund it and let's do it, even though the only objective of it was to understand interstellar space. So this image kind of represents our best understanding of the sun's movement through the Milky Way. And I'll come back to that a little bit later because we have other information about just beyond even this region, as in what kind of part of the Milky Way are we in? What's it like? And if you want to say, for example, travel to stars at a, say a fifth of the speed of light, which some people are proposing, you need to know this stuff. You need to know what particles are there, what will we collide into, what will the energy be, you know, what gases are there. You need to know uh, what is the domain you're traveling in. Because if you're like a stationary particle in space is nothing to you. But if you're traveling past, if you're going to travel and intersect that particle at a fifth of the speed of light, suddenly it's um, a projectile that's going to destroy maybe uh, a, a, a substantive part of your tiny little space probe. So you need to know about these things. And that's why we're mapping them. And this image shows another star in the Milky Way just traveling through. And you can see what's got, it's kind of got what's called a bow shock wave. As it pushes through the gas in front of it, you see that it's actually kind of compressing the gas and there it glows and energizes. And, and, and we think the sun is doing something similar, although we can't see a bow shock wave. We had hoped we would see one more visibly, but we don't see one. But the, the same kind of effect is occurring as we saw from the um, Interstellar um, Boundary Explorer. Now, we're going back to many of these moons, as I meant, uh, mentioned before I step on. I need to re-emphasize that. Again, what's going on here is quite, um, how can I put it, pointed, quite purposeful, even if it isn't all, there's nobody sitting down in a room saying, right, this is what we're going to do, guys, for the future of exploration. But nevertheless, there's no waste here. There's no, there's no um, and, and there's no, there's no um, procrastination. We are basically, at the shortest possible time, doing everything we can. So part of that is to go back. So we're going to send Europa Clipper to Europa um, to, to orbit it. There's a proposed Europa lander to burrow down through the ice to see, is it water? Are there uh, microbes there? And then I show images here of SpaceX's Starship and the Sp Space Launch System, because these gigantic rockets, which Space Launch System is ready, and the uh, Sp uh, Starship it will be ready within, let's say, let's, let's, be, let's be kind, 10 years, right? Well, these devices, let's put this in perspective. Getting New Horizons out to Pluto took nine years, and that needed multiple gravity assists from the likes of, of Earth, actually, and of Jupiter. And those gravity assists, so for example, the gravity assist from Jupiter shortened the journey to Pluto by three years. So if we didn't have a gravity assist, we would have been 12 years at least to get to Pluto. The space launch system can send a space probe out to Pluto with no gravity assist in three years. And the, and, the, and the Starship could do it even quicker. And not only that, but, and this is a, a very, I suppose, controversial aspect of Starship, Starship is all about refueling in space, because if you think of most rockets we build, they, they've used most of their space escaping the Earth. Well, what if you could refuel your rocket? Then you can push huge payloads to the outer solar system. So there's all sorts of missions being planned now to send space probes back to Pluto and out into the Kuiper Belt and into the Ur Cloud uh, to try and really find out what, what is the outer solar system like. And this, of course, then has been added to with um, great intrigue because of the recent um, discovery of this um, asteroid that came and visited our solar system from another asteroid. And I'm going to try and pronounce it here. Um, um, Amyumia, um, Amyumia, I think it's called, pronounced. I'm not very good at this. But nevertheless, this is an asteroid that has come in from our solar system and back out the other side, and is traveling so fast that indeed the only space probes that could catch it would be space probes that would be launched either from the Space Launch System SLS or a Starship. And indeed, well, maybe a Falcon Heavy, but it would take much longer to get there. But indeed, proposals are already being indicated that we want to visit. I mean, think about this. We will be visiting a, uh, an asteroid from another solar system. So we will be getting direct, hard evidence of what other solar systems are made from. The science is, 
is compelling it's extraordinary and it's an opportunity that shouldn't be missed now already we've discovered another asteroid coming in from from another solar system so now that we've discovered one we you know our telescopes are just getting better we're convinced that this is probably not as rare an event as we might have thought and that we're going certainly we're ramping up as well to be able to chase these um visitors from other solar systems in the near future which is very very exciting science to be able to literally sample maybe land on one and think about that take samples from an asteroid from another solar system and we may well be able to determine which solar system they came from in fact there's already papers being published peer review papers suggesting which star systems this asteroid came from so this graphic here kind of shows that now it's, a, it's what's called a logarithmic graph. So you know, um, we kind of go one, ten, hundred thousand. So we're we're jumping up in powers of ten for the same distance each time. So it's not the scale, and we can't we couldn't show things to scale. But we, we I'm showing you here that the solar system you know is out in, in what, what we call astronomical units, which is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So we tend to measure these great distances not quite in light years in astronomical units, and um, we're we're saying that maybe the uh, the outer edge of the solar system is. Is around 100 astronomical units, around 20 billion kilometers, and then actually the edge of the Earth cloud goes out maybe 100,000 astronomical units, that's well over a light year, and then we got Alpha Centauri, the nearest star to us, somewhere in the region of maybe around half a million um, astronomical units away, maybe that's a bit big, is it probably about 200,000 astronomical units away. So the thing is, is that we're already uh, uh, thinking about measurement scales that's my alarm, I beg your pardon. I set my alarm to remind me that I might be running out of time. I think we're doing okay. Um, so the thing is, is that we're already thinking about measurement scales beyond the solar system. You know, we're, we're thinking out there. And I suppose that's, if I'm probably overemphasizing, but that's the, I suppose, the central point of this talk to say, you know, our minds are out there. There are groups, many serious science groups who are all there energy and thoughts are to beyond the solar system to explore it. Now this graphic I have here I'll skip because I need to zoom in on it and we don't have that availability in this source. So straight on then what we're going to just do for a few minutes is step to the galaxy level beyond the Milky Way or out to the Milky Way that is our home galaxy which is a vast system 100,000 light years across and a light year again I think is 10 trillion kilometers and is made up of what hundreds of some people say up to 400,000 million stars I think we're settling on around 200,000 million aren't we so that's an extraordinary system so where are we in this well you know just taking a look at the kind of um, uh, broader picture by examining other stars by sending space probes to measure the position and movement of stars um, in real detail, and we had space probes like Hipparchus in the um, in the in the, in the uh, 90s, and now we have Gaia from Europe, which is m m m monitoring the the movement, the position and movement of 1.6 billion stars in the Milky Way ga uh, galaxy. Um, and both Hipparchus and um, Gaia are the brainchild of a British astronomer called Michael Perryman who is an adjunct professor of UCD and a colleague of Professor Lorraine Hanlon who runs the Space Centre here in UCD and um, he was the one who wanted to understand the precise position and motion of stars and he has um, championed these two space probes that are telling us about our place in the grander scheme in the Milky Way. So if you look at this image here, not only do we know where we are, we're between two spiral arms called the uh, also the, the Scumpton Centaurus arm and then the Persis arm in what's called the Orion Spur. So we're kind of not, we're not far from the Orion yet, but only a mere 1400 light years. But we know where we are, but we've also defined a coordinate system that actually was a surprise to me in preparing this talk. I thought our coordinate system, galactic coordinate system would be centered in the center of the galaxy, the black hole that's there. No, our galactic coordinate system is centered on the sun in our solar, in, in, in our galaxy. And I suppose what I'll say to you is, imagine if you wanted to travel to another star, how would you get there? I mean, okay, you can see it, but the thing is, is that, what, you know, how accurately do we know where a star is in the sky? Could we literally send a space probe pointed there? You know, because if you're out by even tiny fractions of a degree in, you know, in the sky, then you might miss it by a couple of light years. So the notion of understanding a coordinate system in the solar system or in the Milky Way, in other words, understanding our orientation, our place, our movement, our overall position in the Milky Way is also a field of, of real intrigue and interest. So this image here of the Milky Way shows our path. We orbit the Milky Way every 220 million years. We know that path 
quite specifically. Not only do we travel around it, um, sorry, this is just another image showing the Uruguayan spur. I'm going to move on. Um, but we know our orientation. We're 65 degrees to the plane of the Milky Way. We know in which direction we're traveling. We, in this particular image here, actually, we know that from the Northern Hemisphere, that when we're in winter as we're approaching, and we're, look, our, we're, on, we're on our night sky, and we're looking at Orion, that's looking out of the Milky Way looking out towards the outer edges of it. Whereas on the, when we orbit the other side of the sun, uh, six months later, and we're looking, uh, our night sky is looking in at the galaxy, which is why we see the likes of Cygnus and the, and the Milky Way high in the northern sky. So we have a very good understanding as to where the sun's orient, uh, sun is in the Milky Way, our orientation. And even we know that as we travel through the Milky Way, we oscillate up and down. These kind of what are called gravity waves travel through the solar system or through the Milky Way galaxy and then um, cause the, the, the spiral arms to, to form and then the accumulations of gas and dust that affects the whole um, gravity uh, concentration because matter causes gravity and that affects our motion. But we, we, we know to a very fine detail how we're moving through the Milky Way galaxy. And indeed, even in the sky, what's called the solar apex, it's, it's in the constellation of, Her of Hercules, we know in the sky precisely which direction the sun is traveling. And when we actually look at Gaia images of that point sky, we see all the stars, kind of many of them coming at us, like in one of those Star Trek episodes. So we ha we're, we're getting this confirmed even in real time by seeing the other stars and the directions they're moving in. Now, these couple of graphics are amazing to me because I, I, and I, I have to admit, I haven't fully explored research-wise how we know this. I believe it must be through radio astronomy. But we know that in our region of the Milky Way galaxy, in this image you can see Betelgeuse, which is on the outside, and Anter Therese, which is ahead of us in the direction we're traveling. We know we're in a local bubble. So we kind of know that we're inside this kind of vacated space. Now, there is material there. You'll see it's more complex in a minute. But this outer bubble, it's also expanding. And on the edge of that bubble, we get star formation. So, for example, the beautiful Pleiades that we see in, this, in, the, in, the, in, the, um, um, in the night sky in the winter, it's, it's actually rising now, isn't it? Quite late at night. So the Pleiades are new stars, only 40 million years old, have formed on the outer side of that bubble. Isn't that remarkable that we know that actually we're trying traveling through a bubble on which the outer rim is almost like this material upon which we're getting star formation. And here's a 3D motion graphic of it. Uh, we even know the shape of it. And indeed, this is a graphic showing that as the sun has been traveling through it, it's been expanding over millions of years, and we've, we, we were even able to backtrack and retrace the history of it. So, as I say, we're beyond the solar system, what we were looking at earlier on, but we're in a region now where we're looking at our Milky Way locale and we're understanding what's going on in our galaxy, what we're traveling through, in which direction we're going, and which stars in the sky are our neighbors. And indeed, to be able to say that the Pleiades are a result of star formation on the edge of a bubble that we're actually traveling through. And here's a, kind of a more specific image of it. In fact, there's a cloud quite close to the sun called the local cloud. And you can see that Alpha Centauri is inside us, uh, so it's slightly closer to the, but four light years to the uh, center of the Milky Way than we are. You can see that Sirius is kind of trailing behind us by eight light years. So we, we have a very good understanding of the nearby stars, which direction you know, that they are in. And indeed, you can see that Alpha Centauri is slightly below the sun in that image. And of course, that's the case. The sun is below us, and that's why we can only see it in the southern hemisphere. So one of the points I kind of want to emphasize in the talk is, I, well, I certainly find it intriguing that we can now start to relate the real dynamics and dynamism and shape of the Milky Way to what we see in the sky. And I'd urge you to do that. If you find out something that Webb imaged or, J or Hubble imaged, try and find out where in the sky is it. And then try and find out where in the galaxy is it. Because I think that kind of connectivity just gives us a better sense of I mean, who we are, where we are, and what sort of environment we're in. So we got it before. We've got two sections left in the talk here to take a look at some of the nearest stars to our solar system, and then, of course, to talk about the discovery of exoplanets. And we've got a few animations here to show artist impressions of some of these animations because we're coming slightly close to the home again from the galaxy, from the outer galaxy dynamics that are or regional galaxy dynamics, I should say. And we're now actually looking at the nearest stars to us because these are surely going to be the destinations over the next hundred years. If you think about it, prior to visiting Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, the goal for 
our generation, people of us in the 50s or 60s, would have been to get to Jupiter. That was done, and then what happened next? Those scientists coming up in the 90s said, we want to get to Pluto. What did I say earlier on? We're now talking about sending big space probes back out into the Kuiper Belt. And as we'll see at the very end of the talk, the spawning of ideas to send tiny space probes to Alpha Centauri is also a thing that's starting to emerge now. So with that in mind, and of course because we're curious anyway, and we're building the telescopes just capable of, 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 of doing this, we're actually searching for planets around other stars, exoplanets, like there's no tomorrow. As we all know, that's the hot topic today. What are we doing? We're building the maps for the future. We're building the guides for those who want to travel to these planets in 100 years. Whether we see it that way or not, that's what we are doing. We're, we're really getting down to wanting to know the real fine-grained detail about planets near our star system that we may actually contemplate, or at least our, our, our children's children may contemplate, figuring out real earnest ways of, of getting at least some sort of space probe there and at fractions of the speed of light. So this beautiful graphic shows some of the stars that are quite close by. So we've got Alpha Centauri, of course, is the closest. We've got Barnard Star, which is the, the second closest star. We've also got these the GL Galice. This is a, for researching this talk. I found out that um, um, Willem Wilhelm Galice was a German astronomer. He only passed away in the nineties, um, and he was just interested in this himself. So he just went about and catalogued about nine hundred and thirty of the nearest stars, red dwarfs. Innoc innocuous stars that nobody else had a real interest in because they weren't super giants or they weren't supernovae. They didn't tell us the big astrophysics problems, but he just thought, I want to know about them. So he, he mapped their spectral characteristics. He determined their distance as best he could, their position. And so he was, he was Galice. And, so, and this catalog has become invaluable for um, exoplanet studies because all the exoplanets we're, we're able to detect are quite close to us because our techniques only reveal exoplanets around stars that are relatively close to us. So you'll hear a lot of Galice systems like Galice 589 or 781. These are, now the Galice catalog actually was expanded beyond his work to a higher precision as well, um, using or, or, or well over 3,000 stars. So you will actually, um, as I say, hear of a lot of Galice systems when we talk about exoplanets. I've just got a couple of different graphics that show this. Here we just see, slightly closer, we can see actually where Bernard's star is, Cygnus 61. Uh, as I say, I find the one I found intriguing in this because I never thought about it. I'm a big Star Trek fan, and you had the Borg destroy this, you know, the, um, um, the, the what do you call it, the Starfleet at Wolf 359. And sure enough, Wolf 359 is a real star that's only about five, six, seven, eight light years away from us. So um, there you go, who would have thought? And Sirius only eight light years away. So we know the stars that are nearby. This is actually slightly further afield, and just to show this kind of moving graphic is to show that not only do we know where the stars are, but actually we have a very good three-dimensional handle on this right now. This is a crude graphic. We, we could make this many, many times uh, more specific, and indeed even we could zoom in on this on this computer if, if we wanted to do so. Now this one here, um, if you have a pair of you know, your, your, your cyan green uh, goggles or your red green goggles, put them on now, because this actually shows these nearest stars um, in 3D as they orbit here. And again, I think it's nice to see, I mean, my argument in this talk is, become familiar with the local Milky Way. That's what I'm, I'm really arguing here. Because loads of other serious scientists, are that they're making that their job, and we can, we have the information. So that's what that graphic's about. Now, I'll just skip on a few more different maps, but another thing I just need to point out here is not only do we know the position of the nearest stars, we know what way they're moving, so we know that some stars are going to come closer to us in the future. So Proxima Centauri, in about 25,000 years, it's 4.2 light, light, 4 light years away, is actually going to come around 2.9 light years from us. Barnard Star, it's about five, like, 6 light years away, will get to within 3.9 light years of us. So we know that there's Galice 445 is actually going to get within about three and a half light years as well. So many of these stars are going to come close to us in tens of thousands of years. It doesn't affect us, but that's not long on the cosmic scale. So the sun and the other stars are moving with respect to one another, and we can see that. Now for a final phase of the talk, we just want to talk a little bit about the exoplanets that are close by and some of the details that we're discovering about them. So of course, we've been detecting exoplanets for many, many decades now, since 1992. These are some Orion images, or Hubble images of the Orion Nebula. 
that reveal forming solar systems. And this was very exciting for Hubble. And if you uh, if you haven't come across this, it was only announced yesterday, the James Webb Space Telescope has imaged the center of the Orion Nebula, just as Hubble has done here, and discovered something absolutely spectacular, which is that in this field that we're looking at right now, the James Webb Telescope has discovered multiple pairs of Jupiter-sized planets that are gravitationally bound together and they don't have a parent star. And has, after the detecting of 12 of these, it was announced only yesterday, so a whole new dimension to planets we didn't even know existed a week ago. So this is kind of what's going on in exoplanet studies. And uh, check for those Orion Nebula images from the Hubble, Hubble Space Telescope. But over time, it's become more sophisticated. There's Hubble actually imaging the movement of um, uh, a star called FOMALP-B. The way we label exoplanets at the moment is we name them, so the first exoplanet around a star will be the name of the star with an A after it, and then the second planet discovered will be a B. So uh, FOMALP-B is the second exoplanet discovered around FOMALP. So, um, and there we see it imaged by Hubble. The Kepler Space Telescope, which is now not working, um, was scanned a small region near our local locale of the Milky Way, but in the direction of Cygnus, and discovered so far about 2,000 plus uh, solar systems, and we'll come to a few of them just in a few minutes. Down in the European Southern Observatory, it's using an amazing instrument called Sphere, uh, and HARPS, two instruments, to discover exoplanets and also forming solar systems like we see here, dust disks forming around nearby stars. And the ALMA infrared telescope, not only imaging dust with this, but actually also imaging planet formation as it's happening right now. And even we're able to image using, this is a HARPS image from the European Solar Observatory, a solar system, there's four planets orbiting. Look at the dates on the bottom. It's going between, um, what, what's over, it's from 2009 to 20, uh, what's the date, 2016. So this is a seven year image and we see four planets orbiting a star. The star is blacked out using a thing called the coronagraph, it would be too bright, we wouldn't see the stars otherwise. And this is to show you the red sphere that you see there, where in the middle of where it says, so, is where almost all exoplanets are being discovered. So you can see, we're discovering exoplanets in our locale of the Milky Way. The beam beaming out is where Kepler also imaged planets out, maybe you know several thousand light years, and then there's a couple of exoplanets detected on the inner parts of the solar system. Now, there are multiple programs for discovering exoplanets at the moment. The pale blue dot is a beautiful reflection of Carl Sagan's pale, uh, sorry, pale red dot, I'd say, is, a, is a, a nod to the pale blue dot by Carl Sagan. The pale blue dot initiative is to discover Earth-like planets around nearby red dwarf stars. And boy, has it been successful to date. Because I mean, the closest stars to us, Alpha Centauri, which is a pair of stars very like the sun, and then a third star in the system called Proxima Centauri, which is a red dwarf, just about over four light years away from us, um, shown here in the Southern Hemisphere from the European Southern Observatory. Well, we've already discovered planets around those. And th there's just some images of Proxima Centauri, Alpha and Beta. Uh, so Proxima Centauri Alpha is just about 1.1 times the size of the sun, and Proxima Centauri Beta is about 0.9 times the size of the sun. They're very sun-like stars, and the sun, really, it's extraordinary that the stars so like the sun, so close by. But here's an image then, or a little movie I'll let run for a few minutes, that just basically shows um, an artist's impression of there's Alpha Centauri A, and Alpha Centauri B, and you can see the Milky Way in the background. So remember I said Alpha Centauri is looking in towards the, Mil the Milky Way. Well, there it is in the background. And as we approach Alpha Centauri A, we should see in this, again, artist's rendition, um, Alpha Centauri, um, uh, um, so Alpha Centauri A, A planet. Okay, if that makes sense. So, And this planet is an Earth sized planet. Now we don't know a lot about it, okay? So we know a lot more about other exoplanets. This one's quite challenging to determine about, but we know it's Earth sized, which is very, very exciting. It's quite interesting that it's orbiting this star stably because we've got another star nearby which might disturb it. But I think the power of these animations is really important as well to contemplate, and I would urge you to go online. A great place to find all these animations is the European Southern Observatory website, ESO.org. It's actually written on the on the slide there. And once you look at those images, um, you'll realize we know a lot about them. Here's Proxima B. Now, the thing is, is that um, 
the point is, is that we know more about these exoplanets now than we knew about Pluto in 1980. That's an indicator of how far we've come. We know a lot more about Proxima b than we do about Alpha Centauri a. a. Um, so Proxima b is the second exoplanet in the system. So Proxima b is a small um, uh, red dwarf star. Here we see Proxima b in the habitable zone. That's the green zone. So it's highly possible there's liquid water on this planet. It's Earth-sized. Now, the problem is, is that we know that red dwarf stars, although they're much dimmer than the sun, eject massive flares every so often. And those flares may cause a lot of stripping of atmospheres of planets. But in fact, there's been a paper released recently that suggests that even with these flares, that um, magnetic fields of both the star and the planet itself might deflect it, and so it gives more hope that maybe the planets aren't affected by these flares. But all red dwarf stars are, are characterized by big flares. It's kind of weird. They're much dimmer than the sun, so you think they might be calmer, but no, they can, they, they can really show their temper every so often. And here we see a conjecture as to what we think Proxima b might be like. And these artist impressions are only artist impressions, but they're based on the best scientific information. And they are important because they get us thinking about these places as real worlds. Um, I'll just move on here, and here we all, I've just discovered recently that indeed the Proxima Centauri system has an asteroid belt, that's the inner ring there, and then this beautiful dust belt ring. Now this is not an image again, this is an artist's impression of it, but we know, we know they're there. Um, if I move on, this is an image then of what we think the surface of Proxima B might look like, with Alpha, or, um, Pro, um, Proxima Centauri star nearby, and then in the distance, only a quarter of a light year away, in fact less than a quarter of a light year, a couple of hundred um, million um, a couple of hundred billion kilometers away is um, Alpha Centauri A and B uh, bright, looming bright in the sky there. Now, in fact, I actually added um, a little star map of this one here just to suggest to you that any exoplanet you hear about this being discovered, actually go online and just try and find out where in the sky it is and maybe get your binoculars or telescope and have a look at the, at the star. And I think it's, it's lovely to know that when you look at a star, we know this planet's there. Again, I just think on a human level, that, you know, this is a, a sky now, it gets back to the point I made in the beginning talk, a sky we're getting to know. We're beginning to realize that some of the, like, if you remember, um, there's a classic science fiction movie, um, Forbidden Planet, where they visit a star around, a planet around the star, Altair. Well, alas, we already know that Altair probably doesn't have planets. So unfortunately that killed that one off. But it's nice to know the, the, the identity of the sky that we're actually um, looking at. Now, this red dwarf pair, uh, Luhmann 16, is the second closest thing to us in the sky. And they were only discovered in 2014. We didn't know they existed. It's two red dwarf stars. We don't, or beg your pardon, they're not red dwarf stars, they're brown dwarf stars. So they're several times the size of Jupiter. They don't glow in the visible light. They glow in infrared. So they're almost like hot bars of an electric fire. And the surface details we see on this uh, Luhmann 16A brown dwarf is actually, we think, um, accurate. Um, the large, very large telescope in Chile of the European Observatory has been able to, believe it or not, map the surface temperature variations on the surface of this brown dwarf star. It's the second closest thing to us. It just beats Barnard's star by a fraction of a light year. But these, these two brown dwarf stars, we didn't even know existed a decade ago, nine years ago. And here they are, the second closest objects to us. So what else is out there, lurking out there? That's kind of what part of this is all about. Barnard's star itself, second closest star, it was conjectured it had a super Earth-sized planet. We feel this is being refuted now. Uh, and, but however, these things go, go back and forth. So it may well have um, a super Earth-type planet. The, the exciting thing about this planet was, if it existed, is that it would have been, again, in the, what we call the Goldilocks zone and would have uh, had water or could have, could have had water on it. It would have been quite a stable planet. So um, however, um, re you know, recent work has suggested, no, that planet doesn't exist, but I would say come back on this story because it's it's bounced back and forth. It's been basically discovered twice and refuted twice in recent years, so definitely we're talking about a system here. I'll skip over these two slides that tell us how we discover exoplanets because I want to get towards the end of the talk and talk about a few more systems. So another system that's very close to us is called the L9859 system, right? It's in the constellation of Volans. 
and it's 34 light years away. Why is it so exciting? It's got five Earth-like planets. Think about that. Five Earth-like planets. And again, we think one of them is a super-Earth that's dominated by water. And in fact, we think up to a third of the mass of this planet is made of water. So if it has an ocean, and if we're correct, that ocean would be at least hundreds of kilometers deep, if not even deeper than that. Um, so this is an extraordinary planet. We don't find one like that in our solar system. There's a phrase by um, uh, a, um, a student of Carl Sagan's called James Pollock, if I'm right. It's an amazing phrase. He says, on Earth, where there is water, there is life. There is no exception. And that's a very, very powerful statement about the, the, the connection between life and water, as our life as we know it, and water. So that's why we're interested in planets that have water and again i put it to you that here's a solar system 34 light years away we know how many planets it has how big they are and we're starting to decipher what they're made of including of water isn't that quite extraordinary and we're getting near the end here there's a couple more i want to mention but one of the most recent discoveries by kepler space telescope was the confirmation of something we had hypothesized throughout the last 10 years as what we call a high planet this planet's called k2 18b They'll get nicer names, right? We just haven't gotten there yet. And in fact, the International Astronomical Union puts out citizen science and student pro uh, um, um, uh, projects every year for students to name planets. But the uptake is not that good. The Blackrock Castle Observatory in Cork ran one of these before Christmas. They asked if you wanted a judge on it. And they got no participants at all. So they cancelled the project. Isn't that incredible? And you had the chance to name a planet. So this is something maybe even the IAS, many of us have to think about encouraging young people to do. So what's a high CM planet? This is a new kind of planet that doesn't exist in our solar system that was hypothesized in the last 10 years or so. And even though it was hypothesized, our James Webb Space Telescope actually has just now gone and discovered one. They really exist. So what is it? It's a planet maybe two or three times the mass of the Earth. So not like Jupiter, more like Earth, that has a, a dominated by a liquid ocean and a hydrogen atmosphere. And the reason why we thought those kind of planets existed because most of the planets we know, like even Earth, had a hydrogen atmosphere in its very early history. But hydrogen so light that it escaped even before four billion years were up, and then we only got a second atmosphere from outgassing um, and maybe asteroids and, and uh, comets colliding into the into the Earth. But the thing is, is that if you got a planet that's maybe three times the mass of the Earth, it would hold onto that hydrogen atmosphere and so if those kind of planets exist they've got a hydrogen atmosphere they've got water if they've got carbon as well they've got all the ingredients for life and so it's hypothesized that those sort of ocean worlds might be uh, prime um, uh, locations for searching for life and extraordinarily excitingly um uh, James Webb detected a, what we think is that what we call a biomarker in the atmosphere I need to put my glass on uh, dimethyl sulfide. So the James Webb Space Telescope was so powerful, it only took it about a half an hour to fully characterize the spectrum of that planet, k 2 b and was not only able to confirm that in fact there's loads of methane in the atmosphere, but also carbon dioxide and then d dimethyl sulfide. Why is dimethyl sulfide so exciting? I didn't know, nor did you before this, but the only way we know dimethyl sulfide is made is through protoplankton on Earth. Earth's atmosphere has it, and it's a byproduct of protoplankton. So there may well be an inorganic um, or a, a non-biotic source of this dimethyl sulfide. We're not saying there's life on this planet, but it's a biomarker, and we're going to continue studying the planet uh, and hopefully determine. We may already have discovered the first planet with life on it. We don't know, but we're kind of hypothesizing it. And just then to finish off, we're kind of seeing here Galice 581, one of these planets just 20 light years away in Libra. Again, what we believe is a water-dominated world that may have land surfaces as well, but is in the habitable zone of its own planet. And again, a computer animation of it to demonstrate what it looks like. And I think these computer animations are worth running for yourself. In preparing this talk, I ran about 20 or 30 of them for myself. We have these animations and every animation is based on the best available science information. They're not just arbitrary artist impressions that are kind of guessing. There are best estimates as to what these planets look like. And when you look at 40 or 50 of these, or even if you look at six or seven of them, you begin to convince yourself, you realize, my God, we are beginning to get a handle on the, as I say, on this region of the Milky Way galaxy.
And I finish all this, and um, just a few minutes left, um, with the Trappist One system that we've all heard about. So the Trappist One system is uh, it's about a, it's well over hundred light years away. What's so exciting about it is that there's uh, seven Earth-like planets in the region. Er, well, I should say Earth-sized planets because Earth-like implies it might have water and possibly life. Earth-sized planets, and again we characterise many of them, and there are many beautiful animations on the European Southern Observatory website for you to observe and see these planets and even what they what some of them might look like close up. Here's an artist's impression of what one of them might look like and it's showing ice on the surface there. So to conclude in the talk, we're 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 we're, we're going well beyond the solar system in multiple ways. Well first of all we're revisiting the outer solar system. We have plans now to send big space probes back out to the Kuiper Belt, maybe to the Earth Cloud. Now we have to get the funding for these, but we want to do them. We want to characterise the Sun's interaction with the outer Milky Way to know what, what particle and plasma and magnetic field characteristics characterise our local Milky Way system. And then, of course, we want to know, the big, you know, this is a $64 billion question, what planets are out there and which might hold, hold life, because they are going to become the locations to think about in the future. And again, I go back to the beginning of the talk, to Kepler and Galileo and Tycho Brahe and to um, Cassini, Mars was the great domain for them to understand like the exoplanets are for us. It would have seemed utterly implausible for them to visit those worlds. That wasn't for their time. What, that didn't deter them from the, analysing everything that they wanted to know about those worlds. And everything they did aided us. We're in the same position now with exoplanets. We're analysing these things to the hilt. We're doing everything we conceivably can through James Webb Space Telescope, multiple programmes on the ground, launching space probes, analysing international, or the interstellar medium. We're doing the same kind of groundwork that those astronomers did. It's the same story. It's just a greater domain. And what's very exciting about it is we're barely scratching the surface. Now, what we can say is that any young astronomer watching this excited about getting involved in astronomy in 20 years' time is... Pluto isn't going to be your destination. It's done. Your destination is going to be Proxima B. That's where you're going to want it. So, of course, you're going to have ridiculously hard engineering challenges associated with that, but that's what the challenge is going to be. And to finish off on the very last thought, that kind of thought process has already begun. Now, it's taken a little bit of a hiatus because of the war on Russia and Ukraine, but one of the Russian oligarchs actually put $100 million of his own money into what's called breakthrough star shot where he wanted to propose sending a tiny space probe a few grams in size to Proxima B. Well he originally said Alpha Centauri until we discover Proxima B and then it became Proxima B. And the idea is to have a sail in space of very light material and we place very powerful lasers on the ground and we fire them and push the sail and keep pushing it until it reaches a fifth the speed of light. And if it reaches a fifth of the speed of light and Proxima Centauri is four light years away, then it'll take 20 years to get there. And then if it has a little cameras on board, just four years to transmit its data back. So a 25-year mission. That could happen in our lifetime. Maybe even us old fogies giving this talk might witness this. But certainly, if that sort of kind of space probe can be realised, many of, the, of you watching this, uh, of the younger people watching this, may well see the first actual images of Proxima B or Alpha Centauri um, A in your lifetime. And like the, the people behind this, like Freeman Dyson, one of the greatest theoretical physicists of the latter 20th century, Stephen Hawking, the lady on the left there, and Rianne, she designed the gold disc on Voyager and on, 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 on the plaque on, on, on Pioneer. She was the wife of Carl Sagan and co-wrote Cosmos with him, one of the most influential people on the planet. They believe in this. If they're putting their weight behind this, then they believe that at least this, this is worth contemplating. Now, of course, it has taken a hiatus because of the um, war in Russia, so I'm not quite sure where it is funding-wise. The website's still there, and uh, I, I assure you it's not going away. The Planetary Society, we played a small part. We sent a test, test sail into space. There it is. We launched it about five years ago. It, it, it stayed in Earth orbit for a few years. Don't have an image of it unfolded. I should have put one on this PowerPoint because there are images of it unfolded. And so we tested the sail technology. And although it moved very slowly, the sun's light pushed it. Now, this wasn't actually, um, as I say, solar particles or you know, particulate matter or solar. Particles. It was literally the momentum in light 
pushing the sail, and we were able to push it from a low orbit to a high orbit, from around, I think, from around 400 to 1,200 kilometer orbit over several years. It spiraled outwards and proved that sail, light sails work. Now, the problem with sending a light sail to a near star, by, star nearby is if your lasers you know, damage the sail, you can send 20 gigawatt lasers on it. Or if the sail actually tilts and then goes off track, you have a huge task. So actually, the latest reincarnation of the idea is that your sail will be kind of a shell of incredibly light material, but almost like a per perfect sphere. So that no matter what part of the sphere that you fire your laser on, it's not going to steer off course. And then, even if that does happen or you lose some en route, you might actually send a thousand of them out, all in this wide laser beam, and hoping that several of them will actually reach their destination. So, that idea has even evolved in just the last few years since it was first proposed. And you can see the way we're thinking. And indeed, the sort of little probe, you can see it there, about two centimeters square, with little chips and cameras and power and all radio transmitters, has already been designed. And that indeed has even been sent into space. So the actual little probe we sent to Alpha Centauri, or Proxima Centauri, is, has actually been kind of prototyped already. So that's where we're at in relation to the outer solar system. It's multifaceted. Probes to revisit the outer solar system, probes to the Kuiper belt, mapping the, you know, the, the, the um, outer Milky Way, understanding our place in the local Milky Way from a, a kind of a, a perspective. And I would urge you to try and, you know, look at online images of the Milky Way and then go out to the night sky and find out what part of that Milky Way am I looking at here? Where is Cygnus? along you know, this ribbon of the Milky Way we so often see. When you're looking at signals in the night sky during the months of June and July, July and August, you ask yourself, where on the Milky Way is that? Get to know your region. And the last thing I would say in this talk is, is that if you're interested in things like discovering exoplanets, there are multiple citizen science projects, like there's NASA's Exoplanet Watch, whereby if you've got, an eight, say, an 8-inch refracting telescope, then you can actually go and... Um, they'll give you the, the data and you go and search for exoplanets, try and see, can you see what are called transits, where you see the, the star's light dip as a planet moves by it. Or even if you don't have a telescope, the Kepler space probe, they want people to look visually at the images and detect exoplanets that we just haven't seen yet. And indeed, 31, or is it 38, in the 30s, 30 exoplanets have been discovered by people around the globe just by looking at the Kepler data. And while you're doing that, keep an eye on these discoveries. And as I say, for me, and I will be doing this myself, I think it's the exciting dimension of this talk, or the, this subject, is, as I say, to link these discoveries with the night sky. So you can look at a particular star and say, there's a solar system there, there's no solar system there, that's 28 light years away, that's 6 light years away. To get to know, as these books have said, for, for um, eternally, you know, our local um, galactic neighbourhood, our local cosmic neighbourhood. So thanks very much for listening.